I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation. Uh, I think I'm happy, no, I know I'm happy, but I think I'm done. I guess that's a better way to put it. Anyway, today we're going to continue with, actually, I hate to talk about it as a continuation because each of these talks kind of stands on their own. So even though we sometimes call it part two, it's really just another in the series. Uh, today we're going to talk about the invention that really changed the world. And then we're going to more or less virtually sail on some of the great ships and even a few of the liners and cruise ships. Uh, so right now, let's go. Full steam ahead. The man who's credited with inventing the first practical, and I have to say practical because there are people who argue that he wasn't the first that invented it, but he was the first one who invented a practical steam engine, and that was James Watt. He was born in Greenwich, Scotland back in 1736. He worried about finances for his entire life, be, in spite of the fact that he was really quite wealthy. Uh, he meticulously documented his inventions. Uh, he was also kind of a tinkerer because he would always try to make them a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. So some of his inventions have pages and pages of modifications. In today's world of consulting and engineering, that would be a ka change order all the time. I mean, that would make a lot of money. Anyway, he was considered to be a kind of a poor businessman because he really disliked uh, bargaining and negotiating for the use of his uh, equipment. Anyway, that being said, he was very skilled with his hands and he was highly respected. He was a president of the Royal Society for quite a while and a lot of prominent men in his time uh, were his closest friends and he had a lot of very long, lifelong uh, friendships and, and relationships. He was known as the inventor uh, with very active imagination and the use of steam engines to uh, power machinery and factories really paved the way for the Industrial Revolution. Now this is kind of how a steam engine works. Uh, I don't show the boiler here, but outside of this picture there's a great big black thing called a boiler. Back in the early days it was fired by coal. Today most of the boilers that are still used for steamships are fired by either diesel or by oil, uh, anyway, or sometimes even gas. The hot steam comes out of the boiler and it goes into that through that valve and there's a little slide valve that goes back and forth and the steam goes in and pushes against the piston and then the slide valve moves back and forth to change the side of the piston that the steam presses against and then as the steam cools in the engine during that motion it, event, it vents out through the stack as cool vapor and of course all of that is hooked to some articulation that causes the wheel to turn. Okay, so everybody understands how a steam engine works? Can somebody explain it to me? <laughs> the engine shown here is pretty typical of the ones that were used to power factories back in the late 1700s. Uh, Susie and I had, a, I guess you'd call it an opportunity, to me it was a great opportunity, she wasn't so thrilled I don't think at the time, to visit the London Museum of Water and Steam. Uh, basically, uh, we went there several times. When it was founded, it's relatively new museum. It was founded in 1975. It was called the Kew Bridge Steam Museum. Uh, it was rebranded re in 2014 and they did a lot of uh, upgrades and major renovations. Uh, but for me, it was kind of like being a little kid going to a toy store. It really was because a lot of these engines still work. They have these remarkable engines that go from very small engines to these gigantic engines with pistons that are a hundred inches in diameter. You know, you're talking something that's nine feet in diameter. That's a big engine. And those engines were three stories high. And most of those engines they still have in working order. So it was a really enjoyable place to go to get a better understanding of how steam engines work and how they were put into use in industry. Robert Fulton of New York, uh, he put two and two together and pretty soon steam became uh, probably the one of the most common means of propelling a ship. Fulton was born in 1960, or 1965, doesn't he wish? 1765, uh, and he's credited with designing the first commercially successful steamboat. Now when Fulton's steamboat went into service, his announcement called the boat the North River Steamboat. Everybody ever heard of that? No, everybody thinks it was Claremont, but it was called the North River Steamboat because at the time, North River was what people called today's Hudson River. 
Now, many people do believe that the name of the boat was Claremont. There's no record that, that uh, Fulton ever used that. He called it my experiment or my steamboat. He never called it by Claremont. Uh, he only called it by the North River name. The steamboat was rebuilt during the following year. Uh, basically, the hull was made wider, the bo a new boiler was installed, new passenger accommodations were put in. Now, to me, that sounds like he built a new boat. It didn't sound like it was rebuilt. Uh, basically, that's another one of those big change order things. Anyway, uh, scheduled service began a year after that, and the steam engine powered ship quickly became very much in high demand. Remember, boats and ferries at that time, when you wanted to go across the river, they either had to be pulled by a horse, if you could get along shore, like in a canal, or you had to sail or row. There was just no way to just kind of motor across. And if you didn't have favorable winds, oh well, you had to wait. Now we're going to look a little bit about how these boats and ships evolved. SS stands for steamship. The SS Savannah was originally planned to be a sailing vessel. Uh, but before it was completed the, in the United States, it was actually built in Savannah, Georgia, and that's why they named it that, uh, the owners decided that they wanted to operate it as a hybrid steam and sail vessel. So they had steam engines put in uh, with big paddle wheels along the side, and she made her first successful crossing of the Atlantic Ocean in 1819. Well, they only got 80 hours out of the 633-hour trip by steam because the rest of the time the boiler wasn't working properly, so the rest of the time they had to do it by sail. Uh, the owners decided later on that, well, they were going to go back to all sail because it wasn't really economically practical to have a steam engine. And besides that, all the coal that they needed for the steam engine took up room that they needed for cargo. Makes sense to me. Anyway, another ship about the same era, the SS Royal William, uh, had the same steam sail configuration. She was a Canadian steamship, and she made the first crossing of the Atlantic Ocean almost entirely by steam power. Well, she still had to use sails occasionally during boiler maintenance, but basically she made the whole trip by steam. With the new hybrid uh, configuration, the SS Sirius left Ireland in 1838 and sailing for New York. They had 40 paying passengers on board, and it took 18 days to make the crossing. Sirius was the very first ship to cross the ocean entirely on steam. She never set her sails for anything. Well, they did have a little bit of a problem. They ran out of coal. Well, these were pretty ingenious people and pretty creative, so they started to take the furniture out of the guest cabins and use that for fuel. <clears throat> when the guests said, no, you can't have the bed, they decided they had to cut down the mast and use that one too. <clears throat> but they made it all by, by steam. Now, most of the early steamships were simply refitted sailing vessels, uh, but the Great Western was the very first ocean-going vessel built specifically as a steamship. Uh, it used its sails only for backup uh, if something happened to the boilers. She left England four days after the SS Sirius left, but she arrived in New York only four hours behind it. So she was quite a bit faster. A uh, ship's captain sometimes used both sail and steam because they could get a little better speed, sometimes a little better efficiency. And interesting, that hybrid combination of, of mechanical power, today it's diesel or diesel electric, and sail is coming back today. There's some merchant ships operating out of Norway with that hybrid configuration, and they do that because they get better efficiency. The HMS dri driver was a, uh, this, I love this description, she was a wood paddle ship that was commissioned by the Royal Navy in 1841. Uh, HMS stands, of course, for Her Majesty's Ship. Uh, she, oh yeah, not the ship, or you no, know, the ship, not the queen, uh, was described as a square-rigged, sailed, six-gun warship. That's a ship of the line, I guess. Driver was credited with making the first round-the-world trip by a steamship, and during that trip, she was the very first steamship, uh, steam-powered vessel to go to New Zealand. A driver displaced 1,100 tons. Oh yeah, about 1,100, just a little less than that, and had a 280 horsepower engine. My car has on much that many horsepower. Anyway, you can kind of compare that to Insignia. We are a 30,000-ton ship, 
with 18,000 horsepower uh, worth of engines. The SS Great Eastern, was a, she was huge. She was an iron-hulled ship that was built in 1858. When she was launched, she was the largest ship built to that date. She could carry 4,000 passengers around the world without refueling. Uh, Great Eastern was propelled by both sail and steam, as was common in that era. Her, her engines were reported at 8,000 horsepower, and she displaced about 18,000 tons. Uh, throughout her life, the Great Eastern was plagued by some misfortunes. As she sailed down the Thames River on her maiden voyage, uh, there was a huge explosion in the forward boiler room that blew off the forward deck and the forward funnel. Uh, there were a couple of people that were injured in the engine room, but the ship was not destroyed. Uh, the blast was all contained because she had these heavy iron bulkheads, very strong bulkheads. The ship survived. She was returned to dry dock, and she was repaired. The Great Eastern's first, I guess you'd call it, successful voyage to America began with 35 paying passengers, not quite the 4,000 she was designed for. Uh, they had eight company deadheads, and those are people that don't pay, and 418 crew members. Now that's what I call a good service ratio. <laughs> the voyage and many that followed weren't exactly the economic success that the owners had hoped for. People looked at this ship as kind of a jinx ship. They didn't want to go on her because they were always afraid of what had happened to her early in her life. Uh, she never attracted large numbers of passengers, even though she promised to be the fastest way across the ocean. After she had a pretty difficult and spotted career as a uh, passenger vessel, she went into cargo operations, and then she was converted into a cable layer. And she was the ship that was used in, in, as a, in that capacity for six years, laying the transatlantic and the Mediterranean uh, telegraph cables. Uh, she was refitted as a passenger service after that, um, but people still didn't want to go on her, uh, so she finally was scrapped in 1889. The Peninsular Steam uh, Navigation Company was an English shipping business that was, ina they inaugurated the first modern steamship era, if you will. Uh, they were later joined by the Canard Line. Uh, rival lines started to compete for the fastest transatlantic uh, crossing in what became known as the Blue Ribbon or the Blue Riband uh, Award. Uh, the Blue Rye Band is, still was competed up until the last of the big cruise liners was uh, decommissioned. <clears throat> By 1900, the German Deutschland Company uh, had cut the transatlantic sailing time down to nearly five days. They were you know, a little over five days, five and a half days or so. And remember that just a few years before that, crossings were measured in weeks, sometimes even months. <clears throat> Now, the English built the RMS Oceanic in uh, Belfast. I've got to get some water. And that's in Northern Ireland. <coughs> RMS means Royal Mail Ship. That means that they carried mail for the British government. Now, the mast and booms on that ship uh, were only for lifting cargo and handling the boats. They were not for sails. She could carry no sails. This ship carried 2,000 passengers and a crew of 349 not quite the service that people had over on the Great Eastern. She was the first true steamship. She had no sail capability. Her top speed was 30 knots, so she was a very fast ship. And at two-thirds of that speed, she was capable of circumnavigating the globe without refueling. The RMS Royal George was built in Scotland in 1907. Uh, she had two stacks, two masts, and three propellers. She was 526 feet long and had a beam of 60 feet. That meant that uh, she was roughly the same size that we are, a little bit narrower, a little bit shorter, uh, but she could cruise at 19 knots with a passenger accommodation for over 1,100, a little more crowded than we are. Uh, when World War I broke out, Royal George sailed from Canada uh, to England with part of the Canadian Expeditionary Forces. Uh, she continued to function as a British troop ship throughout the rest of the war. In 1919, RM, uh, RMS Royal George made her first of five visits uh, or trips for the Canard Line, and that was uh, on the Liverpool, England to New York route. That became very famous over time. Uh, she was eventually converted into an emigrant depot ship in Cherbourg, France, which meant they put her at a pier and that's where the immigrants coming out of Europe would wait for their ship to come across the Atlantic. 
RMS Titanic, you probably have all heard about this one, was owned by the White Star Line. She's one of uh, three of the Titanic uh, uh, class ships that was ever built. Interestingly, she had four stacks, but only three of those stacks were really functional. The other was more for decorative purposes, and the designers put it on there to make the ship look more impressive. It was really just a big pile of metal that functioned a little bit as a, as a vent. Uh, at the time, Titanic was the largest passenger ship in the world, and she carried 3,500 passengers uh, and crew. She was powered by three steam engines, and she had three propellers. Her top speed was 23 knots. She was 883 feet long and 93 feet wide, and she displaced 46,000 tons. Uh, Size-wise, the Titanic was uh, 300 feet longer than we are and about 11 feet wide, uh, narrower. Um, her accommodations were primitive, I guess is the best way to put it, compared to what we have, and the ride was quite a bit rougher because they had no stabilizers and they had no bump up on the bow. Anyway, Titanic was a pretty spectacular ship. Um, uh, she was built in Belfast. Um, if you go to Belfast, they have a really interesting, very, very well done Titanic museum, which is done right at the shipyard and the factories where the Titanic itself was built. It's an interactive museum that has stuff that's really suitable from little kids to seniors. It's a great museum. I strongly recommend it. Uh, she was declared by her builders and by the Royal Navy as unsinkable. Well, we all know what happened because unfortunately in 1912 on her maiden voyage, she struck an iceberg and sank. In 1932, the RMS Empress of Australia was just preparing to pull out of Yokohama, Japan. Uh, tugs were about to pull her out. They didn't have thrusters like we do, so they used tugboats at that time. Uh, pretty soon, the ship started to lurch from one side to the other. There was a lot of activity. Buildings on the shore were collapsing. There was an earthquake. Uh, the pier was collapsing beneath the crowd. There was a, you remember those days, people on? No, you don't. You're not old enough. People would throw confetti off the ship, and the people on the shore were going, Bon voyage, and the band played. It was all spectacular. Anyway, all those people out on the pier were now dropping into the water because the pier was collapsing in the earthquake. It was the great Kanto earthquake that devastated the center of Honshu province. Uh, hundreds of people were on the dock waving goodbye. Crew and passengers used hoses to put out fires that were coming onto the ship from embers that were blown from the hurricane, destroyed buildings in the city. Uh, ropes and ladders were thrown over the side so people that were getting dropped into the water from the pier could climb aboard the ship. The captain of the ship sailed out of the harbor with the survivors. Of course, it was a hard thing to do because there were other ships and everything else in the harbor at the same time. Uh, anyway, they took the survivors to a safe place where they could offload them. At the end of her career, uh, RMS Empress of Australia became HMY Empress of Australia. Uh, that's His Majesty's yacht, and that was for King George VI, who used it as, as his uh, royal yacht for tours of Canada. Pretty nice boat for a yacht. During the era of the Titanic and the Empress of Australia, ocean liners had essentially four classes of cabins. From the 1920s to the 1940s, the accommodations were similar to what I'm going to show you in the next uh, few slides. Anyway, the owners or the governor's cabins uh, were the absolute best in comfort and features. Uh, these were usually reserved for senior management of the company or very special passengers. You know, people like Britney Spears or George Clooney or, you know, those kind of people, special people. Uh, this was a first-class cabin from an Orient Line ship that was back in the 1940s. Uh, first-class cabins were pretty comfortable, very spacious, and well-appointed. Uh, the guests were treated to the best of service that the captain and his crew could provide. Passengers paying for this service uh, ate in elegant dining rooms, and they dined on you know, pretty good gourmet meals. Not quite as good as we have, but pretty good meals. Anyway, uh, First class was elegant, it really was. But even within first class on these ships, there were varying levels of opulence. I guess depending on whether or not you had a porthole or a window, you probably did not have a balcony. A step down was second class. Uh, second class dining room shown here was on the SS Mauritania uh, when she was sailing from the United Kingdom. Service was pretty good. The accommodations more than adequate. 
comfortable and utilitarian cabins were normally shared with up to three other passengers. Generally, they were from your family, but not always. Uh, usually, family members, uh, sometimes just people you met on the pier. Uh, Second-class cabins all had attached and suite bathrooms. Typical of the third-class cabins on the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth uh, were pretty much like this. They were cramped. They were often shared with three or more people. Uh, it was kind of another step down, if you will, in the, in the level of service and the quality of service. Each cabin might have a sink, might have a sink, but all the toilets and showers were communal, and they were down the hall from the room you were in. It was kind of like the economy on an airplane. Now, shown here is a third-class dining room on an early Norwegian passenger ship. These dining rooms were generally crowded. They had a lot of people that sat at these long tables. Uh, food was prepared family style, a little bit different than what we see today. Uh, the dishes were passed down from a serving end to the far end of the table. And as a result, the people sitting down at the far end of the table sometimes got an empty platter. So they had to wait until the next serving came out from the kitchen. And even if the table, the platter wasn't empty, a lot of times it was just cold. This is a photograph of typical steerage class sleeping area on a White Star Lines. It was where most of the passengers, absolute most passengers were housed. It was the bottom of all the classes on the ships. Uh, it was basically called steerage. It was a place deep down in the aft end of the ship. It was way down deep. It was below the water line for the most part, down near the steering engines, down near the propellers, you know, just above the shaft alley and so on. Uh, and it was very noisy. But in order to maximize the profits, the shipping companies tried to get as many people as they could into these spaces. In fact, the people were put on shelf-like beds, kind of like cordwood being piled up so they could get more and more people in there. You were not given a room. Uh, toilet facilities, when they ex existed, were poor. This place was cold, damp, crowded, and very, very noisy. Ventilation was poor, and toilets and showers were insufficient. Most of the people in steerage brought their own food. But the reason they did that, it was the cheapest passage, and it was all that could be afforded by many of the people, immigrants who were crossing the sea to find a better life. They crowded aboard these ships in the hundreds so that you'd end up with a ship that carried maybe 4,000 of the immigrants and then 300 other passengers for a very large ship. Conditions on the ships were so bad in steerage that people huddled up on deck just to get some sun and some fresh air. Uh, pretty much when they were coming across the North Atlantic, particularly in the fall, winter, and early spring, uh, they were exposed to cold ocean winds and inclement weather. Uh, thankfully, sometime around 1936, mass migrations pretty much ended. People stopped coming across the Atlantic, and steerage became obsolete. But the shipping companies were now thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, what about all the money we were making in steerage? We have to find something to replace steerage. We need to replace those aging vessels to become more efficient. The markets changed, and the middle-class tourists started to replace the immigrants. Uh, pretty soon, the elegance of new passenger liners replaced these crowded old ships that were basically common through most of the earlier era. Now, recently, I took Susie on a cruise, and she wasn't at all happy about our accommodations. So this is the luxury cruise you promised me. Actually, now that we're back on Insignia, she's a little happier. The French were not to be left out of the races across the Atlantic, so they planned their own passenger liner. Uh, the SS Normandy was built in France, and at the time, she was the largest and fastest passenger ship afloat. Normandy still has the distinction of a ship with the most powerful steam turboelectric power plant. Her engines were rated at over 200,000 horsepower. Uh, she was pretty lavish on the inside. In service, Normandy made 139 transatlantic crossings westbound from Europe to North America and one less eastbound. She was not considered, never considered a commercial success and had to rely on the government of France uh, for subsidies to keep going. The mural shown here 
uh, on this slide was in the first class dining room on Normandy. Uh, it was that mural, by the way, is currently in a New York Museum of Modern Art. Uh, during World War II, the Normandy was seized by the authorities in New York, and she was renamed the USS Lafayette. Uh, 1942, while she was being converted to, for use as a troop ship, she caught fire, she capsized, and sank. Although she was salvaged, a restoration was found to be way too costly, and she was scrapped. Throughout the age of the passenger liner, companies used posters like this. They also used things in magazines like Collier's and McCall's and Life and so on. They put these full-page ads and these posters out. Uh, that was to advertise their ships, to make things look better. Now today, of course, they use the Internet and television and all that sort of stuff, but, but back then it was all done with posters and, and marketing. Uh, they proved to be a pretty good marketing success, and they, in, they ushered in what became commonly known as the Age of the Queens. Um, the posters touted fast and magnificent transportation services across the Atlantic, and the Cunard and the White Star Lines were building super liners, basically, that would rival all. This is Queen Mary uh, at her mooring in California, and Queen Mary II is in the background. Uh, RMS Queen Mary sailed the North Atlantic from 1936 until 1967. And that was actually a planned first of two, uh, two ship uh, express service between Southampton, England, and New York. And they were going to have one ship that was going to be going west and another was going to go east. Queen Mary was huge for her time. She had a gross displacement of over 80,000 tons. The largest room on this ship was the first-class dining room. Uh, it basically was two stories high. Uh, the indoor swimming pool also was two stories high, but half of that was filled with water. Um, and among other facilities they had on the Queen Mary were a children's nursery and a kennel. And I guess parents had the option of where they could put the kids. Shown here is Queen Mary's bridge. Uh, she was fast. She sailed at a high speed for most of her maiden voyage. But because heavy fog kind of settled in over the Long Island, New York area, uh, she had to slow down for the final days of her crossing. In 1936, Queen Mary captured the Blue Riband for crossing the Atlantic with an average speed of 30 knots. That's pretty fast. In 1940, Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth were in New York, and there they waited for the Allies to press them into service as troop ships. They were painted with a kind of a gray camouflage cover, and because of the, their operations, they were nicknamed the Gray Ghosts. RMS Queen Mary went down to Australia to, to carry soldiers from there back to Europe. She was eventually joined by Queen Elizabeth. In 1942, Queen Mary carried over 16,000 troops from New York to Great Britain. That was a record for the most passengers ever transported on a single vessel. And I can guarantee you they were not in individual cabins. <laughs> they were in hammocks and bunks and very crowded. Uh, together, the Queens were the largest and the fastest troop ships in the war. Because they could operate at speeds that were much higher than any of their escort vessels, most of the time they didn't operate in convoys or with escort vessels because that would cause them to have to slow down. They could just outrun any kind of German submarines that were operating in the area, so they just went off by themselves. Shown here is a slide, that, uh, it's a commemorative postcard that was uh, presented to the soldiers that were coming back to America on Queen Elizabeth after World War II. Uh, the Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary were carrying passengers back and forth across the Atlantic, and, and they sailed between New York and London. They went back to the service they were originally planned for. Uh, and they often passed in mid-ocean, and when they passed, and this was always kind of a planned event. They would try to get them so they'd be close together as they passed, not so close that they would hit, but close enough so you could hear each other. Then they'd have the bands playing up on deck, and they'd set, fire some fireworks, and, you know, everybody would be happy, and they'd wave at each other, and then they'd sail off. Uh, Queen Mary was retired in 1967. She's uh, in Long Beach, as you saw. She's in the uh, uh, National Register of Historic Places for the U.S., and she's permanently moored there as a museum and as a hotel. Queen Elizabeth's role as a cruise ship basically failed because she had very high fuel cost as well as very high operating cost, and her deep draft prevented her from going into most of the islands in the Caribbean, and she was just too big for the Panama Canal. 
but she did continue doing passenger service until her retirement in 1968. In 1950, the SS United States became the largest ocean liner ever constructed in the United States. The United States superstructure was the biggest use of aluminum to that date. Uh, that presented a pretty big engineering problem for any of you that want technical stuff. Uh, steel and aluminum don't work real well together, so if they're connected together, you get all kinds of weird uh, chemical interactions that uh, create bad corrosion. Anyway, it created a real challenge, but they overcame that. Uh, interesting, though, the, the designers didn't use a single piece of wood. You look around this ship, you see a lot of wood. In that ship, there was no wood that was used for anything other than maybe the keel blocks that were put underneath the ship when she was built. They wanted to minimize the risk, so she was built to a Navy troop, st troop ship standard. Uh, there's no wood interior anyplace. The only wood, as I said, were the keel blocks that were underneath the ship and the butcher blocks in the galley. Uh, all the fittings and all the furniture were fabrics, uh, everything, were custom made from metal, glass, fiberglass, spun glass fiber, and so on. Even the hangers that they had in the closets were aluminum. Well, one of the things they had a problem with is, how do you get a piano that's not made of wood? Well, the designer said, well, that's simple. We'll just have it made out of aluminum. Well, all the piano people said, that's going to be pretty tinny. <laughs> they didn't get it. <laughs> anyway, they finally found a wood, and saw, actually, I think they already knew about the wood, but it's very expensive that comes from South America that essentially doesn't burn. Uh, so they used that to build the piano, and uh, uh, that's what they had on there when uh, she was in service. She had the most powerful insta installation on a merchant ship in her era, uh, she could sail nonstop for over 10,000 nautical miles. She was capable of steaming in reverse at 20 knots. Why you would want to go in reverse at 20 knots, I don't know. Anyway, on her maiden voyage in July of 1952, she set and still holds the record for the fastest transatlantic westbound crossing with an average speed of 35 knots. Now, they've had some people that have gone faster than that in these big hydrofoil planes or ships, but they don't count because they're not passenger ships. In order to get the blue ride band, you had to be a passenger ship. Anyway, United States continued passenger service until 1969 when she was decommissioned and she was docked in Philadelphia. Uh, they've been having a start and stop movement that's been trying to raise funds to restore her as a historic ship. Uh, and if you're interested in it, you can get in touch with me, and I'll tell you how to get in touch with the people that are doing that. But it's a really sad sight when you go across the Walt Whitman Bridge in Philadelphia and you look down into the, into the Delaware River and see her sitting there. It's really sad. Uh, large liners dominated passenger travel until the birth of jet airliners in the 1950s. Actually, it was a jet airliner that took away the passenger service itself. Uh, rising fuel and labor costs meant that ships were just too expensive to run. The price of crude oil was to blame, and the lost passenger revenue due to the faster air travel was really the cause. I mean, their costs did go up, but the revenue went way down. The SS France was a French flagship from 1961 until 74, and at the time she was the longest ship ever built and one of the fastest. Uh, she was larger than her predecessor, the Ile de France, but smaller and cheaper to operate than the Normandy. Uh, she could be converted from a class-restricted passenger mode to a classless mode for cruising. Class is where you had first class, second class, third class steerage, and then cruising is kind of like us. We don't have fences between the, the different decks. Basically, she uh, combined regular transatlantic crossings with occasional winter and world cruises, so she was kind of an all-purpose uh, Vessel. She was mothballed after a really long labor dispute uh, with her unions and ultimately was sold to the Norwegian Steamship Company. France was renamed the Normandy in 1980, and improvements that they did to her, uh, or Norway, excuse me, improvements that they did to her were to add new decks. They put a couple of new decks on her. And a lot of purists who remember the old days of the steamships. Uh, really felt that that destroyed her classic lines. I, you know, to me, she doesn't look too bad at all. Um, 
but the added veranda cabins uh, basically kept her financially afloat. She was the first passenger ship or first ship at all that was ex used exclusively for cruising instead of passenger service. Uh, passenger lines, just so you know the difference, a passenger liner or a crew a liner basically would go from point A to point B to carry passengers for transport purposes, just like an airplane goes from New York to London, and that was their sole purpose. Where cruise ships, that wasn't their sole purpose. Their sole purpose was to take people out, enjoy a vacation, and come back to the same port generally that they started in. Things have changed a little bit, but that was the difference between liner and cruiser. Anyway, cruise ships at that time generally always came back to their port of origin, and that created the concept of the cruise ships being a destination of, in and of themselves. Now, the competition for the cruise market grew. This ship was upgraded several times, and she remained the grand dame, the queen of the Caribbean, for a long time. She proved to be popular, and it helped that she was home ported in Miami. So people would come aboard in Miami, go out in the Caribbean, come back to Miami. Uh, in 2003, she was going to be retired after more than 20 years of active service, but they had a massive explosion in their boiler room. And after that, she was basically, they have decided they couldn't repair her. So she was taken out of service, and she was just used as kind of a, a training ship so they could bring crew members aboard, train them about how to operate on a ship, what they needed to do to serve people, and so on. So she was like a floating university for a little while before she was scrapped. A variation on a steam engine was the first nuclear-powered cargo ship. Uh, she was a cargo passenger ship, the uh, NS Savannah. She was in service from 1962 to 1972. Uh, she basically looked more like a yacht than what we think of as a, as a cruise ship or as a passenger ship. Uh, basically, she had a <laughs> 30 cabins, so she wasn't exactly a gigantic ship by our standards. She had a dining room, a swimming pool, a library, and she had a lounge that also doubled as a movie theater. Uh, Savannah's nuclear power plant pro uh, performed pretty well at sea, and her safety record was very impressive. She never had any significant accidents. Fuel economy was unsurpassed. Uh, her paint was never smudged by any soot coming out of boilers and so on. Uh, basically, she went the whole 10 years of her existence without ever being refueled. She did have a problem, though, because her cargo capacity was limited to just 8,500 tons, and most of her competitors at the time could accommodate a lot more than that, maybe sometimes as much as 10 times that. Uh, she was built at a cost of over $46 million and had a nuclear power reactor. And propulsion in this particular case is generated when the nuclear material breaks down and creates heat that then boils the water to make steam. So instead of coal or oil, they just use nuclear power. She was funded by the U.S. government as a demonstration of the peaceful uses of atomic energy. Now, Savannah did demonstrate the feasibility of nuclear power for merchant ships, but it's never caught on. I mean, let's, they, they use it for a lot of military vessels, but not for uh, merchant ships. She wasn't commercially competitive because of the construction and her operating cost. <clears throat> her crew was a third larger than a crew on a comparable ship, mostly because of the power plant. Uh, they also required special training. Everybody on the ship had to go through special training programs. They had to have special certifications in addition to their conventional maritime licenses. Her streamlined hull made loading very difficult. She couldn't handle cargo uh, the same way that other people could handle cargo. Um, that put her at a big disadvantage. And there were some ports that simply wouldn't allow her in. Most notably, it was Japan and Tasmania because they were fearful at the time of nuclear power, so she wasn't allowed to enter. Now, you, today you see ships of all kinds. I mean, you see tankers and bulk carriers and car carriers and general freight haulers and, of course, the container ships uh, that you see all around the world. One of the things that you see a lot of when you're up in the Baltic area are big ferries that go back and forth, like between Helsinki and, uh, and uh, Stockholm. And on one, one night on one of those ferries, this two people came up, a man and a woman, relatively attractive young woman. They didn't know each other, had never met before. And they went to get on the ship, and, uh, and the purser told them, I'm sorry, uh, all the rooms are booked except for one. And, uh, you know, one of you is going to take that room and the other isn't. They said, how many beds in a room? Two. Oh, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. The guy says, well, if you want to go tonight, you've got to take that room. 
because we're sailing a little while, and, and if you don't take it, we're going to leave you behind. Well, they didn't know each other, so they looked at each other, and they said, well, you know, we can get past that man-woman kind of thing. We'll take the room. So they got in the room, and uh, oh, about 9, 10 o'clock at night, they got ready for bed, and they, they had bunk beds. And the woman took the lower bunk, because the man was a gentleman, and he took the upper bunk. About 1 o'clock in the morning, it was kind of chilly. I mean, let's face it, the Baltic can get kind of cold. It was chilly, and the man woke up, and, and he looked out from his bunk, and he looked down, and he went, <coughs> Madam, Madam. And she looked up, and, huh, what, what? Uh, it's kind of cold. Could, could you get me a blanket? She thought about it for a minute, and she looked out at it, and she had kind of a glint in her eye, and she said, I have a much better idea just for tonight. You don't know me. I don't know you. We will never see each other again. Just for tonight, let's pretend we're husband and wife. And this guy thinks, oh, all right, that's a wonderful idea. Yeah, that sounds great. Good, get your own blanket. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> back on ships again. These ships today are really amazing. And, and the thing that's interesting is that we wouldn't have this ship if it weren't for guys like James Watt and Robert Fulton and all the people that did the design work way back then and kind of continued to improve it over time. We wouldn't be sailing on the seas that we're sailing on if it weren't for people like James Cook and William Bly and Gama and all of those guys who took great risks and went out into the ocean to discover new places, places that we can now visit in pretty good comfort. So what I would like to do is to tell you that I'm going out to baristas to have a cup of coffee. I'd like to invite you to come out and join me for a little cup and a nosh, and we can chat for a little while. You can ask questions about ships. You can ask questions about the places we have been, the places we are going. Uh, anything you want to ask, I'm willing to talk about. Susie makes me, tells me I'm crazy because I do that. Anyway, I hope you have a great day today. We've got a nice, calm day at sea. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.